questions for Father Toomey. Um, one is, uh, if the interim report had not appeared, and all we got was the final report, which does contain still some of the welcoming language from the first one, would the final one, do you think, have been received with open arms by everybody, instead of being received maybe in media circles in the end by some sort of a watering down and rowing back? And secondly then, maybe why do you think, it seems to me that when Pope Francis speaks something, the media takes it up as more liberal than it is, but when Benedict said stuff, they took it as more conservative than it, and hardline than it actually was. So why, why that diversion? Okay, that's the first two. And we take one more then, perhaps, and then we'll open it to the panel here. Thank you. I think this is where uh, the lay people, and especially in organizations, I think there could be a significant role for them to mediate the truth because they're able to get the balance right. Like, for example, you know, organizations like the Legion of Mary, um, charismatic renewal, and married couples struggling to live the, by the truth. Um, but they're able to be realistic because maybe uh, family members are gay or divorced or struggling, but by being an attractive magnet and representation of the truth, they can draw in the person because you have to face the fact that they are there okay. and to Thank just you. say I'll not take come, it as big a yeah, question yeah, about the role yeah, of but the role of lay Thank people, you, very much. you okay. know, that that, 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 that can okay, let's bring take those out first the three questions that, of, of the standard and the mercy. Okay. Thank you. First question then uh, was to Father Vincent about. The final report, if it, would it be welcomed uh, if it had come out just by itself without the interim report? How would it have been welcomed, maybe? How would it have been, have, have been received? Well, these are these questions you really can't answer. <laughs> if questions. Uh, I, I would say that um, thanks to the interim report, there was more interest in the final report. So good, you know, all things work to good for those who love God. That's why I'm convinced that whatever happens in the synod is going to be of great good. It's going to be very messy and very, very troublesome, but ultimately it'll be very good. Why, the second question was, why um, is the media so enthralled by Francis and um, didn't give the same attention, to put it mildly, to Benedict? Uh, I, well, that's uh, really a question for the media to answer. Uh, the thing is, very simply, um, Joseph Ratzinger was well known and he had a very negative image before he ever was elected pope. You know. uh, he was chair, he was the um, uh, president or prefect of the Congregation of the Doctor of the Faith. He had to discipline people. He was known as God's rock, Rottweiler, the cancer, uh, Panzer Cardinal, you know, the, uh, all that sort of thing. So th that was the baggage he brought to the papacy. Uh, his initial, of course, uh, appearance for a while dispelled that image, and he came. They saw him. People saw him as he was because of the media, paradoxically, because of the immediate contact that was possible through the first um, appearances that he gave. It soured afterwards uh, for various reasons. Ben uh, Francis, of course, is, was totally unknown. He was not European, though he's of Italian extraction. He came from South America. Um, and he was, he, he was totally unknown. But he also has, he's been blessed like John Paul, John Paul the uh, John the Twenty Third, and John Paul the Second initially as well, blessed with a wonderful personality, and he acts spontaneously. And he's got a spontaneity about him that really appeals to the people. Um, his his predecessor was and is a professor who happened to be against his wishes elected pope. Uh, I'll never forget when I when he um, after his inauguration that evening, the following day. There was a reception for him in St. Paul's Basilica outside Rome, given by the, the community of Rome and the Church of Rome. And there he was ki kissing babies. I never thought my professor would be kissing babies. <laughs> I'm sure John wouldn't be surprised either. But anyhow, I wouldn't be surprised. But anyhow, uh, this is the world we live in. We live in the world uh, of the media. And we, as somebody said, we owe the media so much. But also, the media can distort things. And that's the way things are. And I think it's wonderful. Again, I just want to repeat you know, what was said, that um, his, his smile, his, the way his, spont his spontaneity, he, it actually has touched people's hearts and has brought people back to the faith. 
I had a question about the role of the laity. Um, I mean, actually, most of us uh, in our own lives um, find situations where we've got to kind of get the balance right between mercy and standards. I mean, if you think, you know, sons and daughters you might have or, you know, as you were growing up, um, scrapes you got into or scrapes your sons and daughters get into and problems they encounter and what have you. And you know the standard they should be living up to, but you know they're not living up to it. And you've got to make up your mind, how do I actually handle this? Because you've got to handle it in a way that's not going to alienate them, but at the same time draws them towards the kind of life uh, that, you know, the gospel and Jesus would want for them. And so every day we're actually really having to apply these sort of things in our own lives to ourselves and to, and to the people around us, and often particularly uh, to our children. And I mean, I've often told about lately about the, uh, the prodigal son, because what happened there, the father, he gave him his inheritance, and he knew he was going to get into all kinds of trouble. And he let, he let him make every mistake onto the son. And eventually, having made every mistake onto the son, he comes back. But that would have been a very hard thing for the father to do, wouldn't it? Because he knows what's going to happen. Uh, the, 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 the kind of sensible thing to do, if you like, would have been not to give him his inheritance and try to keep him under control. But that probably would have meant he never actually would have come back you know, to the moral life. So, I mean, like one of the things they were talking about before and during and after the synod was this concept of gradualism, that you can't expect anybody to run the 1,500 metres on their first day. They've got to get there bit by bit. But you do want to get them to get to the 1,500 metres, uh, but you don't take out the whip you know, to do it. Um, and maybe they simply don't want to run the 1,500 metres at all, so they've got to get into all kinds of trouble first, and then they decide, that they decide actually, I better get fit. OK, okay I'll help you. And so the, so, so the role of the laity is actually the, you know, the predominant role of the church, because the vast majority of the church are lay people, and it's up to us as lay people to actually apply the gospel in our own lives and in the lives of those around us, and we ourselves, as uh, often as parents, to get the correct balance between mercy and standards. Okay, any more questions? And is that? We have four questions, okay. Hi, um, so I want to really thank the two of you very much, and in particular, not because David wasn't brilliant, but Father Vincent, because there was very little that I found during the Synod that gave a very accurate account of what was happening. But one thing that, that was to me a new thing, and I suppose shocked me, and I don't think I'm that easily shocked, was the speed with which what would have been considered, a, I suppose, conservative, I hate the word, but Catholic commentators in in the media were hinting or saying outright that the Pope was leading the church into schism and away from the true faith. So very prominent speakers here and abroad saying that. Now, is that a sign, I just wonder what your comment is on that, is that a sign of something else that we hadn't been aware of in the faith of Catholic faith, that they're so quick to see, to, to, to suggest something so radical? Okay, thank you for that question. I'll take another couple of questions. Uh, two points. Uh, first, uh, an objection or perhaps a suggestion to David about the use of the word balance. Uh, we're studying the Catechism in Derry at the moment, and it's like the lost library of, of uh, Alexandria. It's a treasury. I advise anybody, look at the section on the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, I thought after 60 years I, I knew most of it. There's a lot I didn't know and even was wrong about. Um, the, um, the, the question about the unity uh, of the church is based on the unity of Christ. Christ is the church, and Christ is the rock of the church, and there's a unity there that cannot be changed, and therefore there's no need for balance uh, at all. You just have to have love, but that love is love on the cross, as you said, and uh, the, uh, the, the, it, it cost Christ, you know, he forgave the, the lady caught in adultery. Okay, well, and you have a second, sorry, second yeah. point. I have to move you along, yeah. sorry. S sorry, yeah. the, the second point is, is more urgent. I think there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, here in South Dublin. The real hardness of heart and the real lack of, of any quality of mercy whatsoever is in financial circles and in the civil service unions who are bleeding my part of the country and the rest of the country white, and that's causing a lot of marital problems too. Okay, thank you for that. I'll take one more question and then we'll, bit, we'll hear from the panel. Uh, thank you. I, I, I want to congratulate both speakers as well, please. It was a very interesting evening. I think it's a theological question. Maybe it's encroaching into canon law. But if we understand the indissolubility of marriage and Christian marriage as it is, is not the second marriage an invalid marriage? 
And what has the question been asked around the uh, participants in that second union receiving com uh, communion? I'm not talking about marriages that may have been annulled by the church, but if we understood Christian marriage as it is. And if, if that train of thought is accurate then, in situations of second unions, I don't think the church is considered um, exercised about perhaps the tax advantages, the advantages or the property rights. It's the sexual union, I suppose, of that um, second union that exercises the church. And if for whatever reason, a medical reason or a life choice, that the second union decided not to engage in sexual activity, does that then have a particular hue as well in that question? Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's take those four, there's mainly three, I think, but there might be one about unity in the church as well in balance. The Pope, is the Pope leading us into, or was the Pope leading us into schism? <coughs> well, um, somebody, some, I think, uh, Anglican commenting on the Synod said, uh, I wonder, is the, is the Pope Catholic? And a, com a Catholic commentator said, you know, this, he's saying what many other people are thinking. And then somebody replied, no, he's not Catholic, he's Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> so if I might say so, uh, it is a good point. There was a certain hysteria, uh, you know, that fear that I spoke about, you know, people expect them. And that hysteria goes back to a lack of faith, you know. A lack of trust, and really, what the Pope, what Pope Francis has, has done, is to um, open up discussion. Let the things that have been really um, a lid has been put on them. They're going to explode, and they did explode. Let them open. We can discuss. Do, you don't have to fear. Do not fear. Yeah. The truth is there. We mightn't have the truth. There are sensitive issues. People have been hurt rightly or wrongly, by what they perceive to be Catholic teaching. There's no doubt about that, as, as David said, in the past and even in the present. So we can't ignore that. Yeah. So, um, but I think to say he is leading astray is really, uh, as the speaker herself said, is really quite, quite appalling. I mean, on that point, I suppose the concern of people who um, you know, would have thought that, you know, what's the Pope doing here and what's the Synod doing here? I mean, that was partly driven by, obviously, the first report, which was quite loosely worded and quite carelessly worded. Also, the way the media was um, uh, reporting that report with such zeal and such enthusiasm because they were saying, hey, finally, you know, the great cave-in, um, the church is about to join the modern world, so to speak, and kind of, you know, surrender or, or, or accommodate itself to the sex revolution. So they were watching as well how the media were reporting this, so getting worried. Um, but on the other hand, and, and, and therefore getting angry. But on the other hand, you had some people in the church who were saying, fantastic, the church is about to accommodate itself, quote unquote, to the modern world. And these were people who the church, sorry, who, who the Pope is simply not at one with. I mean, the Pope has said, for example, on the issue of women priests, that door is closed. He has said that twice. The Pope has described himself as a loyal son of the Church. The Pope has described the Church still as one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Um, um, some of the people who want the Church to accommodate itself, quote unquote, to the modern world, they do not believe the Church ought to be hierarchical. They do not believe that Jesus even indirectly founded um, an ordained priesthood. Um, I was speaking to a lady today who was at a talk given by some theologian the, um, a few days ago. He's a scripture scholar, as far as I can recall. And he just denies and doubts and explains away all the miracles contained in the New Testament. It seems to me, by the way, I mean, the creation of the world by God, all right, is a pretty major miracle compared with which the multiplication of the loaves and fishes are turning water into wine pales into insignificance. All right, so if God can create the world, why the difficulty with him, you know, performing these miracles, uh, you know, while on earth? But the Pope is simply not with that tendency within the church that would essentially deny the very nature of the church. And there are people who belong to that tendency with the church who are trying to claim Francis and obviously can't claim Francis and shouldn't even attempt to. I'll add a couple of points just there. Um, one thing to bear in mind about synods is they have no authority to teach. 
right? They have none. This synod had no authority to teach. Synods are set up to be a consultative body to help the Pope. And the Pope, the Pope will teach after the synod, after the next synod, he'll bring out a document, more, uh, most likely. And there was a very fine document in the last synod of the family, uh, and it's been mentioned, uh, Father Vincent mentioned, a familiaris consortia by John Paul II, which is very much well worth looking at and needed to be mentioned more perhaps in the, in the, uh, the synod just finished. But the synod has no authority. And for people who are worried about the synod and about debates in the church, the best thing probably is to read the history of the church. <laughs> right? Because if you're ignorant of the history of the church, you may get very worried and upset when you see things being rather political and, you know, difficult. But the church has always been full of difficulties and arguments. All the time. I'm reading a history of the Vatican Council at the moment, Second Vatican Council, First Vatican Council is the same. All of these councils, all the way down along, all the different popes, all the different things have gone on. It's a very human organization as well as being the body of Christ. And the fact that it survived, as, as it has been said before, the very fact that it survived so long is a miracle itself, perhaps one of the signs that it is, uh, that it is, 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 is divine. Now, another question that was asked was about unity and the need for balance. Um, whether there's unity enough is by itself enough, is there a need for balance? I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the question, but do either of you want to comment on that particular question? Well, well, just very yeah. Briefly, yeah. I, I think um, <coughs> you, um, the, whole, the whole synod really has raised up many questions. And one of them is about what is the church, quite simply. Yeah? <coughs> and uh, as David just said there about you know, scripture scholars, there would be lots of other theologians who are kind of questioning the church and, you know, what is the church? And there has been a tendency in general to see the church in very human terms, as though it was just a human institution that could be changed according to the needs of the moment. Yeah? Though there is a human element in it, there is change, the church has changed, of course, our teaching has developed. Uh, but ultimately the church is divine, yeah? And what I found so frightening was the fact that people began to doubt that really the church is divine. You know, that uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this kind of hysteria, this kind of anxiety, was really an indication of perhaps something's wrong. But also, I think, um, of a, a, an exaggerated understanding of what is the papacy. Yeah? Uh, Benedict the, 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 the 15th himself said, the Pope is not an absolute monarch. Like the enlightened monarch who just changed the laws as he saw fit. He can't do it. The Pope is bound to tradition. He just can't do certain things. And we don't have to fear that he will go against the tradition. As David said, you know, he's there. His, his role in tradition, it's been rare that we've had any teaching popes like John Paul II or Benedict. The, very rare to have a theologian as a pope, thank God. That's not their job. But <clears throat> the main thing is, his job is quoting um, can, uh, Pope Francis, quoting canon law, the guarantor. He is the f last word. And as John just mentioned, the Pope will have the last word. Yeah? It won't be the last word that nothing else can be said about it, but he will come and he will make a decision. And it will not also, it won't be infallible. So I think what, what, what actually is happening at the moment on a broader field, apart from the whole area of marriage and sexuality, is we are receiving really what the Second Vatican Council was all about. And one of the things that, um, that, that Francis mentioned was the census fide. The speaker men mentioned Jesus Christ. Yeah? The spirit of Christ is in the whole church, not just in the Pope. And the Pope is only guaranteed a few times. Yeah? And the bishops only rarely. <laughs> Theologians very little, yeah. So, you know, is, is that, um, I think what's happening really, and this is why it's so exciting, that we, after 50 years after Vatican II, we're beginning now, as the speaker said, to understand the richness of the church's tradition. Now, what is the church? The mystery of the church, yeah. But also the hope it can give. And the one thing about the so-called traditional stand is that it seemed to give no pe keep people no hope. And therefore, we who are in that as we're, um, side have to actually ask ourselves, have we spoken in a way that will give people hope? Or have we browbeaten people? That is the problem.
And we've had enough bro beating, thank you. We'll just take the last question now. I think that was a, because I want to skip to it. We have, we're running out of time, unfortunately. It was about the issue of uh, the second relationship. And this brings up the issue of being accurate, I think, in understanding what exactly the church teaches. Because part of the problem, I would say, is people picking up the, the teaching overly harshly and therefore it creates more problems than it needs to. It is a tough teaching, but it isn't as harsh as some people might, might, might think. So, Vincent, I don't know if you want to comment on that particular question, the one about the sexual aspect of what the church is asking for. This really is really a cent the, the central question in many ways, yeah? And I, I believe it to you as a question, what is the meaning of the sexual act? Uh, the, ever since the 60s, the sexual revolution, um, we've seen a, what I would call a trivialization of sex. Even sort of um, ads and papers, sex as a pastime. Yeah? Now that's very sad because it's not much more than that. Yeah? All the great religions of the world recognize that sexuality and fertility are sacred things, yeah. And one act of love between man and woman is what may bring a universe into existence, another being, you know, the human being. Yeah? So we have to regain that. And it is the question of the second union is about living a relationship, which is, to quote John Paul II, is not the truth, yeah. If, if the couple are in a commitment, this is the second issue element, we're talking about a commitment, fidelity. Yeah? Adultery is about infidelity, it's an, an act of injustice before it is an act of, against chastity. So an injured party, somebody has been injured. Yeah? Many people, in fact, children have been injured as well. These are very serious matters. Yeah? Um, then you have the, uh, the, the, the final uh, question, and that is the fact that the final reality, the mystery of evil in ourselves, yeah? our inability to live up to what we know we should do. Uh, I was, one of the articles that really impressed me deeply uh, was an article in The Spectator by, I think her name is Louise Mensch, an ex-Tory MP, I'd never heard of her before, who is actually remarried, uh, divorcee, has a children, and goes to, to Mass every day or every Sunday with her children, brings the children up, they receive communion, she doesn't. She said, I, I can't receive communion. Yeah? And if the bishop tell me I should, I can't. I know I shouldn't. I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I can't do anything about it at the moment. And that is the position a lot of people find themselves in. They really don't feel they have the strength or they can't do it. Um, Reed O'Brien, in her wonderful article last Saturday in the Irish Times, talked, talked about a couple who, uh, I won't give the details now, a young couple who became pregnant, and um, he, she was, he was Catholic and she wasn't, and they were into all the negativity of the church, but they had one Cistercian monk, somebody like a celibate, even more than celibate, a monk in a, in a monastery, and he was a Cistercian of the, one of the most rigorous uh, um, orders, how he helped them gradually to develop and come to you know, solve their problems in a delicate pastoral way. That ultimately these things can only be done by somebody who knows, who's clear about the teaching, but also has sensitivity to people, people's own humanity, and the power of God's grace in people's heart. So, if I might just uh, end with, with, with one very, very small thing, we have to, to sum it all up, we have to recover again the meaning of chastity. Chastity, and I quote the final report, chastity is the condition for love. Thank you.
Now, I'm afraid we've run out of time at this point. Um, I'd just like to make a couple of points, a couple of uh, inf informative things to you, and then give my thanks. The next Iona talk is not in Dublin. It's a, we're very lucky to have Bishop Kevin Doran giving a talk on marriage and the common good on November the 27th in the Abbey Hotel in Roscommon. So that's a bit of a journey, but I'd be well worth it. Bishop Kevin Doran, one of the new bishops, a uh, very fine moral theologian too. There's lots of very fine moral theologians around these days. It's great. <laughs> Second uh, announcement is they, if you wish to uh, make a donation uh, to cover the cost of tonight, to be very, very welcome. So uh, there'll be a, a box there uh, for you to do that. So finally, just to say thank you uh, on your behalf, I want to thank Father Vincent Toomey and uh, David Quinn for their very, very fine talks. It's a great start, I think, to the year of discussion that we should be having uh, leading up to the next Synod, which is a continuation of the previous one. Um, and hopefully there'll be many more events like this, uh, formally and informally. Uh, keep up the reading and the study and the prayer and the talking, because we do need to talk about these things. And I think tonight we were very well served by two very fine talks. So on your behalf, I want to say thank you to both. <laughs>